So I'll start here, seeing as how we haven't really formally met or anything like that. I just figure we'd start at the beginning of, you know, where did you grow up? Uh, how long have you been kind of exposed or known the Kenosha area? Since uh, 2008, um, that's when I actually moved here. And I am, I was born and raised in Racine, Wisconsin. So that Park High School, you know, um, that qualifies me for cheesehead all there. You know, so, but at the end of the day, you know, I just see a lot of things that in a civilian perspective, you know, frankly, I am a deputy in uh, at the Lake County Sheriff's Office in Illinois, okay? And I have two sides of the coin. You know, I can see a lot of things on the civilian side versus the law enforcement side. So I have two takes on it, you know, so it makes me a better rounded person. Because you have to understand if you're in the area that you uh, or the state or the city that you protect, it's kind of hard to take the uniform off at the end of the day. So you still kind of wired up and things and, and you don't understand. Maybe you can't relate to the civilian life, you know what I mean, of the community. And my whole suggestion and theory of it is that when we take off our uniforms, we are a part of the community. And I say I want better for the community than me and law enforcement as well. Yes, and, and you mentioned, you know, growing up in Racine. I, I grew up in Racine, too. There you go. <laughs> and, and, and it's interesting to me, especially when thinking about law enforcement and Racine and Kenosha, because I, I don't know uh, what your experience was growing up in Racine, but Racine policing was a little bit different, a little bit harder than Kenosha was, I think, or it was harder for... Racine used to be the city that people looked at as, you know, really struggling with their minority population. Yes, yes. Um, the, what was your experience growing up with policing, um, with, with police and exposure? I, I, I wonder growing up in your scene. Well, um, they used to come to the school, you know, and it was a part of the school and I would have a conversation with them every time, you know, like, how do you feel about the job? Is it, is it stressful? And they would be just honest, you know, you, it takes a special person to actually become a police officer. And you have to deal with a lot of things that, you know, you can't get in the shower and wash this day off because it resonates with you like P, uh, PTSD, you know. Um, and I know that for a fact now because I've been in a lot of situations and I'll give you a story. Um, I was coming home to Kenosha and um, there was an accident that was on I-94 over uh, Russell Road. It was underneath Russell Road. And I get there, there's a car in a ditch, and there's a car right in the west uh, bound lane. I go and check on that vehicle that's right there on the west bound lane. You know, a couple of broken bones, some people hurt, whatever. You're going to survive. Mm -hmm. I go down to the uh, ravine, and this is where this car must have had toppled over a couple of times, and it landed on its tires. I go check out the lady that was in the back seat from the front seat, her neck was broken. However, I removed her from, I thought that, you know, something was back there. It was a toddler back there. So uh, the toddler had, you know, a little bit of damage to his skull. I was able to get him out, I'm still breathing, um, called Flight for Life, which we do. Um, I, mind you, I'm by myself at the time for maybe a period of over 10 minutes um, without a lot of e efficient light sufficient light. So I do a 360 around that vehicle to see if anything else, and maybe about 25 feet. And uh, from there, everybody else came there, you know, and su supplied it, uh, extra lighting. When I said 25 feet, let's talk about 35 feet. There was another toddler that was ejected out of the car seat, still in the car seat, but it was ejected out of the main frame. Wow. And that child had passed. And, you know, and it resonates with me if I would have went even further out, you know. And so those things, is, it's like PTSD, you know. So a lot of civilians don't understand that besides firemen and, you know, other individuals that nurses and what have you. That's a lot of stress to take, you know. And then now we have situations that police are looked upon in a negative way, you know. And some of those reasons is why I decided to run. You know, I think that we need, me personally, I'm not against police officers. 
law enforcement because I am a part of it. I believe in uplifting and removing that tarnished stain because the incidents that happened in 2020 was national. And I'm trying to run and make this campaign just as national because I want to come up with a blueprint that will help put us back on the map for something positive, different, uplifting, better than it was before. And that comes with the unity process. Yeah. And you mentioned, you know, civilians don't really get, I think a lot of what happened and you saw this a lot in 2020 is that it's really easy after the fact to look back and know what the right call was or to even think, well, why didn't you go out those extra 10 feet or, or something like that? Do you think that, that, or I guess I, I would ask you, how do you get people to see that or to, to kind of keep that in mind that in the moment, that stress and everything may keep you from noticing that thing that somebody calm, you know, in an armchair would on a video. And we're doing it now with your support. You know, um, you have to reach the public and let them know that we're under scrutiny all the time. It takes a special person to do this job. And then one is, if you're a sergeant, a lieutenant, captain, even a sheriff, you know, we have to understand that we were once in those shoes and we should be taking care of our subordinates. You know what I mean? Meaning that praising them, giving them things that rewarding when they do things that are right, you know, following the law, et cetera, et cetera. We have to make sure that we uplift them because they represent us, you know, as a leader, you know? So to be hard on someone for no apparent reason, and I know I, I work at agencies, sometimes you do have commanders and people that are hard on us, but you have to understand those things trickle downhill. So if they're upset coming out onto the road, guess who receives the bitter end of it? Us. So we have to understand those things. And and I want to reach out to, you know, once I'm sheriff, to reach out to all uh, captains and uh, either chiefs for all throughout everywhere, you know, and I know that my main responsibility as a sheriff is the unincorporated areas. I understand that for sure. And I will be out that way and asking for support. But the main issue too is also being something totally different than just policing. Now we got to mend the, the wounds that were given to us, you know, and it's not here, it's throughout the United States. So my goal is to be able to sit at the table like we are now and bring every group here, a representative of every group, to sit down, let's have a conversation. How can we better ourselves as Kenosha County because you have Kenosha County, anything with a county to the end of it, which is Kenosha, is something worth the sheriff should be listening to because he is an elected official for the people, you know, when it comes to that kind of representation. And I believe that the main goal is we have to cooperate. We have to have understanding. And those are the things that I'm willing to do now if it even takes uh, a more of an advanced um, civilian academy, put people in those situations. And that goes back with some of the training ideas that I do have more, it's gonna be more training in regards to uh, scenario-based training, which deals with every aspect of policing, including mental health. And I think that we can learn, get higher professionals because we don't have the answers. And I know police officers, law enforcement, we're not experienced in the way that people think we are. You know, you see a lot of times where people say, why don't you shoot at the foot? They are, we're not trained that way, you know? is what we can hit because you have to understand we're responsible for every round that go past the target, civilly and criminally. So the best part is to aim for the parts that you can actually hit in, in those center mass. So those are the reasons why people have to understand that. And I think the Academy, the Civilian Academy enhanced will help support that. And that means bringing all the, uh, from uh, BLM to the Proud Boys or, whoever it is, you know, because we all have, we all in this together. Yes. And I guess when, when it goes to that, and when we think about that, obviously in Kenosha, we hit national headlines last year around this time with everything that was going on and not really getting into the, that whole event, but how, how do you see yourself addressing the things that were in the community that built up to that kind of explosion of sorts, I, I would say, uh, last fall. And kind of, we're calmer now, but the lingering things afterwards, because that stuff doesn't just disappear. Right, you know? it's, um, I, I get it. And 
the fire's not there, but I guess the embers are not fully put out, okay? And when I, 2019, I brought it to attention to several people in regards to policing, because with the body cameras, we in Illinois, we had it for years now. I love it. And when I talk to some police officers, some of them say like, hey, you know, I don't want to be an actor. But here's the thing. It's part of you being professional in a way, regardless if it's on or not. It covers you and protects you. It holds you accountable and the public accountable. You know what I mean? So this is where we can actually, with those situations that occurred, this is what you do to diffuse some, some of these things. And I see in other states, they are putting that body camera out immediately to diffuse rioters and agitators and get back to the real protest. You know what I mean? And I've been talking to a lot of groups and I'm saying it's your responsibility as well if you're hosting these things to actually police yourselves. If you see someone that's doing something other than what your intended target is, you know what I mean? Unity and fight for rights and, and, and the privilege, you know, to be heard. I think that you should expose the individuals that are not on your agenda. Yeah, and, and you know, it's it, it's funny because that's a thought that I think a lot of people reached uh, maybe towards the end of the whole uh, unrest that we had or the, the big unrest is that you started to realize that, uh, that there had to be accountability by everybody because there are good and bad elements uh, on all sides and coming from everywhere, especially last year in Kenosha. <laughs> At the time, you didn't even know how many groups you were standing around. Right. Um, and I guess, uh, how do you encourage people? Good. Rather, I guess, how do you encourage people to take care of their communities instead of focusing completely on law enforcement to take care of it? Um, how do you teach people or show the line of actionable things the community members can do to make their community better before you hit the threshold of, you know, we need law enforcement, this is, you know, some criminality happening? Well, it appears that uh, Kenosha may have a possible answer with the uh, Kenosha Corps. You know, they've done something that, uh, that the mayor and uh, the Kenosha city is, you know, basically in trial stages. And, you know, right now I heard wonderful things about that in regards to them de-escalating and diffusing situations that even with standoffs, you know, because sometimes uh, you have to understand, I am a crisis member uh, for policing, but we deal with mental health all the time. And it's just as simple as you seeing me on a call could raise your levels up to a high. So I have to treat that is a crisis situation because, you know, you don't know me. You have maybe a feeling that you may go to jail or past experiences. So I have to deal with that and escalate. And this is some of the things that I, I said many times that I am before the badge, meaning that you can call me James and we're having a conversation, but also you know that I am a police officer. I'm in uniform, but I want to reduce that stress level between us by having a simple conversation. And I will get to your level just easy because like I said, at the end of the day, I am a servant and I'm also a protector. And some of the things that are going on that we find out with an investigation, I don't come here with preconceived notions that I'm going to do something to you right now. Let's call it an investigation. And that's why I tell people, I will say, you know, correction officer, uh, I'm a veteran from the army. Um, I was a former detective and I had to make it clear that someone asked me, he said, why is it former? I said, well, I decided to get out so I can pursue this. And it's not a promotion. It's not a demotion. It is a lateral move, meaning that, you know, it's something that you want to learn. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to cover every aspect of policing. One, as a deputy, you initiate the investigation, but you don't have time or you don't have the experience to finish it. So I decided to be a detective so I can be well-rounded in some of the things. And, you know, and a lot of people say, well, how are you going to be able to talk to people, all these people? I talk to people are in crisis, crowds. So if people are sitting down, they come and they're willing to listen to me, no sweat. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I've, I've seen many officers, deputies, and, and some of the things they deal with. And if you can get through a day dealing with half of that perfectly calm people in a crowd, no problem. Right. So uh, I guess... Uh, were you always wanting to be in law enforcement from when you were a kid or or 
was it even conversations with the officers that used to visit you that kind of sparked your interest or when did it take root? Well, when I was 12 years old, um, my mother and father divorced. Okay, that I have two other sisters. I was the middle one. He wasn't really a part of our lives after divorce. And I could have went straight astray and did things that I wouldn't have been proud of now. But something within me, without a father figure or a mentor, told me to do right. You know, I used to dream about, you know, being a police officer at a young age. And that maybe it's because of maybe the action movies or what have you, but at the end of the day, you're protecting someone regardless. And so those things is that like, I know people need the protection and I am willing to do that. And that's why I joined the military first to get a better understanding of the country abroad. And now I wanna focus on doing the county, which, which is Illinois at the moment. But since I've been living here in 2008, I think my attention is very needed here and I'm willing to make that transition and to become the people's sheriff. Yes. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm always kind of curious um, what draws people to the area. I, I mean, I was born in Racine, my parents worked in Kenosha, so my connection's very obvious. Um, but when it comes it comes to, you know, you, you've lived here since 2008, what is it about Kenosha, about Kenosha County, that to you is worth serving, worth fighting for potentially in this capacity? Because quite honestly, we've seen um, how the public and the sheriff have interacted over the last year, and not many people would jump at the bit to have that job after that. Well, the one part is inclusion. Um, we need to be able to be approachable, understand, and like I said, the table itself, because I'm like a sponge. I squeeze up the good in any group, squeeze out the bad if it's negative. I think that is not going to be beneficial to the county itself. You know, I also think that being a representative as the sheriff, the politician, you speak for the people, all the people, north, south, east, or west. And I know in the past there was a lot of division, and it's still division. It's not some of the things uh, I want to bring is say, say for instance, the simple of a stop card. Stop card meaning that it's a copy. It's like a pamphlet that you break apart. One is that it represents the top part where we're from, who I am. And then at the bottom, say if it's I pull you over or stop you because you meet the description. So you're already upset because that's stereotype and some people may think, but it's true. You meet the description at the investigation, I'll let you go. But here's that part of that stop card that has my name, information, and report number, or possibly the incident number, or what's going on, so that you can look it up, say, hey, well, maybe I didn't fit that description. So they wasn't targeting me. That's showing transparency, you know what I mean, and accountability. Yeah. And the same thing dealing with the racial traffic data forms, meaning that if I pull over 20 Hispanics, 20 Blacks, 20 Whites, 20 Chinese, Japanese, what have you, I pulled over the violation, not the person. So it has the probable cause in there why I pulled you over versus somebody saying that you stopped me because I was white, black, whatever, green, purple, yellow. So those are the things are showing accountability. We have to I have so many more things that I would, but like I said, that will come out and later, you know. So those are the main issues, you know what I mean, that we have to show the people that we're trying to protect the people. And I think that Discretion. We have a lot of discretion. As long as it don't break the law, I think that people are deserving of it. You know, sometimes you could say you could say let a person go for a traffic stop. You can actually, if both parties agree on an incident that they understand that, you know, we don't want to move forward with this, you know, then you can actually document it, of course, uh, so it covers us, but let the person go because we're not here to hurt. You know, we're not here to fill up the jails. We're here to educate. And, and that's one of the issues, too. I, I talked to people before that if I'm on the lawn, somebody will come up to me and say, hey, I had a situation, you know, that happened, whatever. What do you feel about that? I said, and I, I don't speak for my department. I don't speak for Kenosha. I don't speak for anyone but myself. But what the education that I know and obtained over the years. And then I would give them a scenario without giving them the actual advice. So you know, sometimes you can just talk your way into the right situation to answer. So we have a conversation. I'm willing to do that anyway. And that's why I said before, 
I've been approachable for a long time. Yes, and, and maybe I just have two more questions for you. And, and I don't, I personally don't like bringing up the whole, uh, relying heavily on race or focusing heavily on it, especially now, um, after everything that's happened. But clearly, if you won, you would potentially, I believe, be the first black sheriff that Kenosha County has probably ever had in its history. And of course, coming at a time, you know, where throughout the entire country we have um, conversations about black representation, black voices, uh, voices of color, and things like that. Um, I guess for you, does that add any weight, any extra motivation? Does that add anything for you, or is that just kind of one more thing about it? Well, I don't want people to vote for me because I'm black, okay? I want them to vote for me because I'm the right candidate. I am a Democrat who is moderate. I'm like a windshield wiper blade. I don't go back and forth to any extreme. Um, my goal is to make sure that I have an understanding of the Republican side, the Democratic side, the independent side, and the people who are undecided. Everybody has a voice. So I'm not back and forth, and people have to understand that. You might as well call me purple and what other colors that come with it, because the law is the law, and that's what I represent. You know what I mean? And I think that any other group or special group, they'll get any favor of the other, because I think that's what technically should be nonpartisan, just like the judges, because I shouldn't veer left or right. You know, I need to keep it what it is. And then if people want a lot of reform that need to be done, especially if it's given to uh, an action that we've taken that is by governed by the law, then you have to talk to your legislators to reform that law if it affects one particular group. Those are the things that I think people should work because you have other politicians that we have to conform to and we have to obey the law. Yeah. And then just the last thing, because, you know, I, I ask what I'm curious about, but when it comes to uh, the public, and, you know, putting yourself out there, what's, if you could boil down into one thing they want you to remember about you, no easy task, but <laughs> if you could, uh, what do you want them to hold in their mind when they hear your name? Unity. I want them to make, to really understand that I, it took a lot of courage to come out. Nobody asked me or forced me. I, I felt this within myself, in my being to come out and try to correct the wrongs that were done before. And I just wanna be the people's sheriff. You know what I mean? Represent any part of any aspect of Kenosha County. And I think if we could come up with the blueprint, which I have that I will discuss later, that I think that other people can learn from this. And then hopefully at the end of the day, we can have some kind of form of bright future for Kenosha and people can get along, you know what I mean? I, it, can you say it's an impossible task? Absolutely not. But if we can move the needle forward like they do in the football field, we're going this way. <laughs> <laughs> so any motion going forward is a blessing. Yes. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you for having me on. <laughs>